The Wolfenstein series actually got its start way back in the early 1980s and actually was a top-down adventure style game. The first person shooter franchise that we know of today would not actually get its start until Wolfenstein 3D. Wolfenstein 3D was not the absolute first first-person shooter, but it was the first first-person shooter to codify all the disparate elements of the first-person shooter genre into one game. Wolfenstein 3 was the very first game that I ever played. Now, it did not receive a direct sequel. It would get a remake will in the guise of Return to Castle Wolfenstein, but it was very different from Wolfenstein 3D. It did not carry on the direct plot. Then we would get Wolfenstein 2009. This would also be a remake of sorts and would not really carry on the same plot from Return to Castle Wolfenstein. There was, however, the returning character of Death's Head. And then finally, in 2014, we would get Wolfenstein The New Order. This was certainly a new order for the Wolfenstein series. It would actually codify all the elements into one game. You would have the direct character of B.J. Blaskovitz. You would actually get all sorts of supporting characters where before there were none. And ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, Wolfenstein New Order basically launched the Wolfenstein franchise as we would know it today it actually would receive a direct sequel, unlike with the original Wolfenstein 3D and Return to Castle Wolfenstein and, of course, Wolfenstein 2009. It would actually get a sequel that would directly carry on from the previous game. And that is the game we are taking a look at today. For today, we are taking a look at Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus. and gentlemen, the sequel is not an easy thing to create. If you change too much, people get mad. If you change too little, people also get mad. Really, you have to find that sweet spot where the game is still within the continuity, but is able to build from the previous game. Wolfenstein 2 does just this. It's not too different from the previous game, but it does advance the plot and it does advance the gameplay somewhat. So instead of just sitting here talking about it, let's jump into the game and talk about it! Wolfenstein II The New Colossus was developed by Machine Games and published by the imperious gaming overlords at Bethesda and was released in the US on October 27, 2017. The game is a first-person shooter of the highest quality. There is no two-weapon rule, and the levels are neither linear corridors, nor are they endless bloody arenas where you get locked into a room and have to kill X numbers of enemies to progress. However, the levels are much more cinematic than other retro-styled shooters. There are no keys or items to collect to progress. In short, you fight through a level and then trigger a cutscene, and that's it. This is not really a bad thing, but I feel they could have made the gameplay that much better by bringing back a key hunt or two. The levels are less obvious than other FPS levels of this era, and I did find myself getting lost from time to time, as every progression point does not have a huge, glowing arrow over it. The levels, however, feel a little more linear and a little smaller than the New Order's levels. But when you actually play the game, you never really notice this, and in all honesty, it's not altogether that annoying. The enemy AI has been vastly improved from the New Order, and the hardest enemy in the game is not the Uber Soldaten. Rather, it's the regular old Lancer. Just like in real life! 
And just like in real life, the Lancers will make short work of you if you're not paying attention. They will flank you and shoot you, throw grenades at you and blow you up, and if you take your time to focus on the large slow target, or LSTs for short, they will shoot you in the back. The LSTs are not the same kind of uber soldaten from Return to Castle Wolfenstein. In Return to Castle Wolfenstein, the uber soldaten killed you quite easily. Here, the uber soldaten are just the, uh, shall we say, mass-produced model. The stamped sheet metal uber soldats. Because in this game, they are easy to kill. Easier than the Lancers in many respects because they're much larger and they don't take that much damage for their size. The Lancers are fast. They actually take a bunch of hits to bring down. I died way more times to the Lancers than I ever did the Uber Soldaten. When the atomic bomb was invented, it was said that the infantryman was the thing of the past because if you could just drop a big old bomb, then you don't need ground troops. But in all reality, ladies and gentlemen, the infantryman is just so versatile. They're easy to train, they're easy to equip, and they're easy to employ. Super soldiers or other sort of super weapons never can really be counted on when you need them the most. And in this game, as you can see, the super soldier is just a waste of time. Like all the other Wonderwaffe that the Nazis attempted to employ. The weapons for the game are much the same as they were in the New Order. You have the super advanced Future Luger, and since this game is pretty tough, the Future Luger is sadly useless for anything other than stealth kills, and I only used it here for the review. The knife does not make a return, but instead you get a hatchet. And it works more or less like the knife, but it's a little more brutal. Then you have the SMG. This was not seen in the previous game, and it works well enough until you get a better weapon. You can get an upgrade for the SMG that turns it into a nail gun. But unlike Quake's nail gun, the Wolfenstein 2 nail gun is actually not all that good. In fact, it actually makes the SMG less useful, as it makes the weapon shoot slower, and it does not do that much more damage. And I actually found myself dying more when I had it toggled on. And I toggled it off after the novelty of having a nail gun wore off. And the description for it is pure hilarity. Apparently the nail gun works by somehow heating the bullets? And this somehow makes the gun more effective? Yeah, I'm not sure how accurate that is. Moving on, we then have the best weapon in the game, bar none. The Sturmgewehr Model 1960. This one weapon will see you through the entire game. It cuts down Lancers by the bushel. It cuts down LSTs like they were saplings. And has plentiful ammo to be found throughout the entire game. The only reason why you would ever switch to another gun is because you're running low on 7.92 Mauser bullets. And I found no other gun in the game to even come close to its utility. Then you have the shotgun. It's cool in theory. In theory, mind you. Also, it's a toggle lock. But being a cool toggle lock does not save it from my ire. It's powerful to be certain, but only at very, very close ranges. And the Lancers love to engage you at mid to long range. And thus, it's kind of useless unless... You are in those tight corridors, and most of the game, you are not. Then, you have the Krumpf Pistol. It makes a return from Wolfenstein the Old Blood, and I never used it. It shoots an explosive grenade that does decent damage, but usually the Lancers are never clustered enough to make this an effective option. Lastly, there is the Laserkraftwerk. This is the second best weapon in the game, and is good for taking out bosses and heavy enemies, but it is hampered by ammo availability. As with the previous game, dual wielding is still just as fun, although you have to be much more careful in this game than in the previous one, as the enemies actually have decent accuracy, and if you charge out into a group of enemies, expect to be shot a lot, so be sure to use the dual wielding ability sparingly. You can also pick up turrets! The laser turret is cool and does a tremendous amount of damage, but you walk slower and are left open to being perforated. You then have the flame shot turret, and it is decent enough, but is only really good for close encounters. And when you do that, you run the risk of splash damage. 
Lastly, you have the worst weapon in the game. The worst turret in the game. The shotgun turret. Its range is appallingly nil, and it takes many, many shots to bring down one bloody lancer. And all it does is just leave you open to opposing fire. It's best left on its tripod where it belongs. The game also brings back the weapon upgrade system, although this time you just find random upgrade modules around the game world, and for some odd reason you can find one in the basement of BJ's childhood home. These upgrades are not nearly as cool as the ones in New Order. In New Order, you got a goddamn rotary rocket launcher that you bolted to your Sturmgewehr. Here, all you get is just some basic damage upgrades and a scope. Seriously, how could you not bring back the laser rifle? That was the coolest weapon in New Order. It was only until I played the game a second time that I realized the weapons are not nearly as good as New Order's, and leaving out that laser rifle is just a travesty. Moving on, we are of course taking a look at the PC version of the game, and it is being run on an RX 480, the 4 gigabyte model to be exact, with 16 gigabytes of RAM, with an AMD FX6300 running at 3.5 gigahertz, and the game is running at 60 FPS. This PC port is, if not amazing, then at the very least a damn sight better than the new Orders and Old Bloods PC ports. On this hardware, I tried to replay the new order before the new Colossus came out. That didn't go so well. I got a quarter of the way through the game and I started getting crashes all the goddamn time, to the point where I couldn't finish the bloody game. Even though on the hardware I had in 2014, the game ran flawlessly. The old blood ran, but not very well, and I barely got over 30 FPS. So for me at least, the new Colossus is a good PC port. I never had any crashes to desktop, and the game kept its frame rate throughout, until the second playthrough for the review. Then I had random frame drops where there were none before, so yeah, it works, but you can potentially have a few minor issues here and there. The graphics menu is filled with all sorts of features that one could possibly want. And like any right and proper PC game, you can quick save any time you want. And trust me, you are going to need the F5 key to be your friend. The graphics are absolutely excellent. Every aspect of this game's graphical design is just jam-packed with details, and you won't be able to notice everything in just one playthrough. The animations are also quite good as well, with everything feeling fairly fluid. As you would expect from Mick Gordon, the music is absolutely excellent, but it's not quite as standout as Doom 2016. There is no Wolfenstein 2 equivalent to BFG Division or Hellwalker, but the music is still good in its own right. Have a listen. And now, let's take a look at the awesome, well-written story for Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus. As always, spoilers shall abound, but if you do get spoiled, I think you'll still enjoy the story either way. The story begins immediately after the end of New Order. BJ and company just took out the main villain for the series, Death's Head. But in so doing, BJ got seriously wounded, and at the end of the previous game, it was implied that he wouldn't make it. So with BJ being only mostly dead, he is taken by the Kreisau Circle, the main anti-Nazi force in the world, to their secret base, a U-boat that was captured in the previous game. On board the U-boat, BJ hastily undergoes some surgery and is saved. But then, as it would turn out, the secret U-boat base is not so secret after all, and it is attacked by the Germans! And BJ must hop in a wheelchair and do battle with the fell forces of fascism. The intro in this game is far superior to the intro in the previous game. For those who don't remember, in the previous game, you started up on an airplane where you had to complete a bunch of pissant objectives, and then when you finally got to shoot something, 
It was a turret section. Here, you start the game up, you get caught up on the story, and boom, BJ is out and about in his wheelchair, killing Krauts with impunity. And these levels are not just on-rail scripted sequences either. These wheelchair levels are true levels, and are actually more open-ended than you would expect. And dare I say, fucking fun? How many FPS games let you blast bastards while wheeling oneself about? Also, BJ has got to be the baddest ass FPS character in history, cause how many FPS heroes can still fight while being confined to a goddamn wheelchair? Although, if old Duke don't watch his health, he's gonna be in one before too long. The main villain for this game is Frau Ingle. She appeared as a relatively minor character in the previous game, but apparently with all the Nazi killing BJ did in the previous game, there were more than a few top job openings, and thus Ingle was able to become top Nazi. And it's more or less as powerful as Death's Head was in the previous game. Also, she apparently has a massive flying doom fortress. Yeah, it's a little silly that such a weapon was not used by the fascisti in the previous game. But let's be reasonable. If the sequel does not introduce cool new concepts, then why have a sequel at all? The battle for the undersea boat goes well until some characters from the previous game get captured by Ingle. Depending on a choice at the start of the game, the raging Scotman Fergus or the generic guy Wyatt can be captured along with the previous game's leader, Caroline, herself first introduced in Wolf 2009. When they get captured, Ingle gives you a choice. Give yourself up and save your companions, or have them be killed. BJ, being a badass, gives himself up, and thus we enter the story's greatness. The game introduces Frau Ingle's daughter, Sigrun, that name of course being a reference to Norse mythology. Sigrun is not a committed Nazi and is not into the whole cruelty thing. Ingle is an abusive parent and mocks her and hits her when she sees fit. She eventually tells Sigrun to cut the head off of Caroline, but she cannot bring herself to do so. Sadly, this does not save Caroline as Ingle cuts her head off anyway in a rather shocking scene. Then Ingle plays around with Caroline's severed head in a rather disgusting manner. When people talk about video game violence, they seldom give context for said violence. Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus does not glorify violence, it doesn't revel in violence, it shows just how horrible it can be. Eventually, Sigrun has enough and decides to intervene. When she does, BJ gets the chance to put on an epic mech suit that makes a return from the New Order. With BJ free, it's time to get some vengeance and escape from Val Ingle's Flying Fortress of Doom, also known as the Altsmercer. After fighting through the ship and doing all sorts of damage, BJ, the character of your choice at the beginning of the game, in this particular view it's going to be Fergus, and Sigrun escape. But before the adventure proper can begin, BJ must first clear out the U-boat, because apparently he was not thorough enough in his kraut clearing in the previous game. Oh, and now the U-boat that you captured in the previous game is now the largest U-boat in the world, being about the size of a bloody Nimitz supercarrier. The game really knows how to balance story and gameplay well. The story never goes on over long, and there's always enough gameplay to keep you invested. After the seamen are ejaculated from the ship, it's time to get this party started. And so you head to the big rotten apple to find some members for the resistance. And hopefully a new leader as well. And there is one sequence that I could listen to over and over again. It's not New York underground crawling with crocodiles. No, I'm from Texas. Yep, that's right. The biggest badass in FPS history? He comes from Texas. I mean, what other state could he come from, other than maybe Alaska? And so you fight through the ruins of New York City and find members of the Black Liberation Front. And they are all a little twitchy, but their hearts are in the right place. And once BJ explains the situation, they agree to help overthrow the National Socialists. So now that we got most of the band together, let's take a look at the characters. The main character for Wolfenstein II The New Colossus is, of course, B.J. Blaskovich. Blasko, or as the Nazis call him, Terror Billy. He is still an excellently written character in this game. Hell, I would go as far as to say that he's even better here than in the previous game. In this game, we finally get some backstory for old Billy. 
He grew up in a home with an abusive father, and this is something that is seldom seen in games, and is handled with both maturity and restraint. Rip Blaskovich is handled with realism. He is both a bad guy and a bad guy. He complains about everything and feels that everything is someone else's fault, and he takes it out on both his wife and son. Sadly, such individuals do indeed exist in real life. Many in the modern era have no problem simply sweeping their existence under the proverbial rug and would rather complain about pronouns. These segments really go far in establishing BJ as an amazing human being. They show him as a fighter. During one segment, you can throw vases at Rip, but they do no damage. But BJ keeps fighting no matter what. This shows BJ's determination. We also see that BJ is an open-minded person as well when he befriends a black female child. He has been told all sorts of lies about black people by his father, but when he meets one in real life, he learns that he was lied to. This segment really does go to show you that BJ has no problem with questioning authority and seeing through other people's lies. And would you believe that we learn that BJ is not a violent man? No, really. He is not a violent man. Killing in defense of oneself or in war is far different from being a violent person. Rip is a violent person. He harms those who cannot defend themselves. BJ was brought up in such an environment and fully rejected that sort of activity as being right and proper ways of acting. Notice that BJ only kills or otherwise harms those who wish to do him harm. He never smacks Anya about because she overcooked dinner. BJ never randomly attacks Fergus for saying things he doesn't like. BJ is actually fairly well adjusted despite having a horrible childhood and spending the last 20 years fighting in a war. If anything, the game shows that BJ is actually a rather gentle soul that has, through fate, been forced to fight his entire life, and despite having to fight his entire life, he has never given up and never given in and has never once stopped being the kind and gentle soul that he truly is. Next, we have Anya. She has been given much more to do in this game and will sometimes accompany BJ on missions, making me wonder why this game couldn't have a bloody co-op mode. She is totally in love with BJ, and there are numerous touching scenes between the two, even more so than in the previous game. She really does get to be more badass in this game than in the previous one as well. And at the end of the game, we get a rather infamous scene where she mows down an entire squad of Germans while topless. However, this scene is not as crazy as it might have been at first appearance. She actually has a legitimate reason for fighting topless. In short, her shirt catches on fire and she has to take it off so she doesn't burn to death. It is definitely a more interesting scene, but one that actually has some basis in reality. Next, we have Fergus Reed slash Wyatt. They both get some character development, but not all that much, mainly because they got most of their development in the previous game. Fergus in this game is as much a treat as he was in the previous game, and there are numerous cool scenes with him. And when he gets the robot arm, let's just say the Fiery Scott gets even more fun. Next, we have the new leader for the game, Grace. She is the former leader of the Black Liberation Front and is nowhere near as bad as other people make her out to be. Sure, she is an asshole, but in order to survive the National Socialists, one must be a bit ruthless, and likely she's a little twitchy after years upon years of fighting. And she can at least admit when she is wrong, and the game thankfully never shows her as right in all things. She is still rather unpleasant though, but not so much as to be unrealistic. You can imagine people actually following this person. That being said, however, I would have preferred that Caroline remain the leader of the Chrysal Circle, and it is still annoying that she had to have sudden sequel death syndrome. The second best character in the game is Sigrun. Old Siggy gets a tremendous amount of character development, and you need to keep this in mind at all times. Sigrun is from a world where all her life she has been told that she is a member of the Master Race. All her life she has been told that the state is her lord and master, and that she must put the state's needs first before her own. 
all her life, she has been told that she must obey her superiors no matter the order. And all her life, she has been under the thumb of Frau Ingel. Like with BJ, she has been beaten and mocked and abused. And yet, she turned against her mother and turned against her state. She refuted the National Socialist government and culture. She, despite all odds, was able to keep her individuality. And as a character, she is one of the most friendly in the game. Although, at first playthrough, I thought it was all a ploy and expected her to turn against the Chrysal Circle in the end. Imagine my surprise and delight when such a thing didn't happen. As a character, she is more or less the audience surrogate. And one of her random character moments really endears her to the audience. If you enjoyed my review, please consider subscribing. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Just because the fat lady sung does not mean the review is over. And besides, that's fat shaming. You then have the various ancillary characters for the game. You have Super Spech, and he certainly is super special. And he is the most annoying character in the game. And the game may actually know this. He is not seen all that much, and at the midway point of the game, he is ejected from it. Into the sun! Well, not really, but still. He is a generic crazy guy with conspiracy theories and things of that nature. And generally, he just annoyed the crap out of me. As he really felt out of place in this game with his nonsensical ranting. Then you have Set. He returns from the previous game as the scientist character. He has become a little more campy and a little more mad scientist-y. But he never gets annoying and is a good deal of fun. Max Haas makes a return and is the game's Hodor character. And is apparently good at being a 60s style artist. His hidden intelligence comes to the fore and makes him all the more tragic because of it. The game features many background character moments on the undersea boat. And in this game, unlike the previous, the U-boat is the game's hub. You can go there after missions and piddle about a bit, and you can overhear various conversations and see various character events. One really funny one that I found by chance was a chess game between Set and Max Haas. If you see them playing chess during your playthrough, wait and see what happens. Trust me, it will be worth it. You can also play the entirety of the original Wolfenstein 3D. It's not a nightmare this time. Instead, it's an arcade game that you find in the U-Boat's Cantina. It is apparently the entire game, but has a few graphical changes. Instead of the player fighting the fascists, it's instead a lone German Lancer that fights the forces of the Kreisau Circle. So instead of a picture of Hitler, you have a picture of BJ, and a few other minor changes such as that. The game within the game plays well, although you can sprint where once you could not. Also, you gotta love the fact that BJ says the graphics are so real that it's like being in the game, man. Back in the 1990s, it really did feel like you were in the game when you played Wolfenstein 3D. How far we have come since then, at least graphically. Now let's get back on that yellow U-boat of dreams and get this revolution started. First up is Roswell. You sneak into a secret military base to kill the upper echelons of the Nazi leadership. The Roswell base level is fun to fight through and features two of my favorite things in an FPS. A big elevator and more importantly, it features an epic train fight. And before anyone asks, no, I didn't fall off the train and died, but I did get shot a lot and died. In order to take out the National Socialist leadership, BJ is going to drop him off a little present, a nuke. Sadly, the National Socialists learn of this plan and they flee the base for safer climbs. Once again, we see that BJ is not a violent man when he steals this Lancer's motorbike. He could have killed him outright, but instead he just takes the keys and lets the hapless troop run away. With the Roswell mission more or less complete, BJ heads back to the U-boat. But on the way, he decides to stop at his childhood home. Also, I love that in Texas there is a tremendous amount of destroyed military vehicles. This means that while Washington might have surrendered, 
Texas fought on. The Texas level is a very personal one for BJ, and you can trigger a number of flashbacks as you go through the former Blaskovitz homestead. One particular flashback really stands out. You can pick up a box of BBs in BJ's childhood room, and the flashback shows that young BJ once suffered from night terrors. Young BJ believed that various monsters would come up from his home's basement to attack his mother, and Rip actually gets a moment where he acts like a real human being. He gives young BJ a BB gun and offers to go down to the basement to check for monsters and even has BJ's mom join in. The whole BJ family goes down to the basement together and in a really touching moment checks it and of course finds nothing. And it shows that Rip had some good in him at some point. Sadly, this is not carried over to the next scene when BJ goes into his parents' old bedroom. He goes in there to find a ring that his mother stashed away. He finds the ring and also finds his father there. And the family reunion is not a happy one as Rip is still a self-centered old bastard. We also learn that he is a collaborator and has sold out BJ's mother. And yet, once again, we see that BJ is not a violent man, for if he was, he would have killed Rip without a second thought. Instead, even when Rip is starting to advance on him, BJ still tries to reason with him. And it's only when Rip is actively pointing a double-barreled shotgun at his head that BJ actually kills him with a hatchet. It takes all of that for BJ to kill someone who has abused him from day fucking one. And then after that scene, the game pulls a James Cameron and shocks you again. The Altsmercer and Frau Engel attack. You are able to strike back, but ultimately are captured. And this is where the shit gets real. You don't escape from her clutches. You go through being imprisoned and tortured and all the rest. There is a segment where BJ imagines himself breaking his bonds and escaping, and by the great Yzmir, this imaginary level is bloody tough. Hardly any cover, limited ammo, and limited health. This is what BJ imagines? Seriously, BJ, just imagine yourself with a mech suit or some kind of doom robot. Anything! This level took a bunch of tries, but since this is just a dream, you are rudely brought back to reality after you complete it. And in reality, you face execution. And then we get the game's holy shit moment. I literally said that when BJ got his fucking head cut off. Head cut off, as in head no longer on body, as in Stumpy McHead Stumperson. No head. After I saw that, I actually had to get up and walk around for a bit because I was so bloody shocked at what they did. That was an effective moment. Head cut off. But as you know by now, BJ is a badass. His fucking head is rescued by the Kreisau Circle and is attached to a super soldier buddy. Now I had thought he might get robocopped, and he kind of does early in the game with the mech suit, but really, him getting a fleshy body is better than getting a robot one, as it allows him to still be intimate with Anya. And I think we owe BJ that at least. He's still skinny though. Look at him. He is like super skinny and just looks weird with his new body. And his new outfit makes him look less like a badass and more like some kind of soccer snob. And after he gets his new body, it's time to get some more allies for the fight against the fascists. And so BJ and company head for Nyalands. And in Nyalands, he meets up with Reverend Horton Heat. And he challenges BJ to a rock off. Uh, I mean a drink off. And old Horton spouts some crap and BJ has none of it. And he eventually refutes all of Horton's idiotic statements. But drinking pure grain alcohol does not agree with BJ's new body. And he has a psycho Billy freakout and passes out. This was all it took for Horton to come over the side of the Chrysler Circle, and they head off to meet up with the U-boat. But getting there requires BJ to meet an awesomeness quotient of 101%. And how does one meet such a high requirement, you might ask? Well, you get on a fire-breathing dog robot, that's how. Yes, BJ rides on a Panzerhund and slaughters all in his path to the U-boat. Once he has done that, the plot goal is now this. 
Capture the defense codes to the Altmercer and take it over to use against the Indie ASP. Like with so many things in the Wolfenstein universe, the code does not reside upon mere planet Earth. Rather, it resides upon planet Venus. Ah, Venus. When Durmond is not good enough and Mars is earmarked for the old Doom guy. The Venus level is fairly fun and is probably the most famous level of the game. It's not quite as fun as the moon level in the previous game because you don't get a goddamn last gun. But what you do get is Addy. Yes, it is upon Venus that you meet Adolf Hitler. And you actually meet him in a Wolfenstein moment. A Wolfenstein moment is where you have all your personal power stripped from you and you have to humor a Nazi. In this, you get King Nazi himself. Addy in this game is a broken down old derelict. Now, his derelict status is fairly interesting. At the end of World War II, he was a broken down old derelict. But that was mainly due to the stress of the war. Seeing as how in this game, the National Socialist won, he probably shouldn't be quite as broken down as he is. But, yeah, well, that's what you get. In this game, he's constantly coughing and vomiting all over the place. But at the very least, he didn't shit himself. I was quite worried that that was going to happen. So essentially, you meet Addy because he is making a movie about Terror Billy. And this is where his characterization is actually historically accurate. Addy was not above stealing other people's ideas or taking credit for them. The 1940 invasion of France was not his idea. It was rather Eric von Manstein's idea, but old Addy would go on to say that Manstein was the only one who understood him. In this particular level, you are supposed to be posing as an actor for a movie based upon BJ's capture, which of course Hitler takes credit for. And if you ever needed another reason to hate Addy, he brutally murders Ronald Reagan. I didn't realize it at the time, but the first actor he shoots is, of course, old Ronald. And the voice actor does a good Ronald Reagan impersonation. With Reagan dead, getting a good American leader just got that much more difficult. And as you would expect, BJ nails the role of BJ Blaskovitz quite well. What's funny is Addy thinks he's perfect for the role, not realizing that it's actually the true BJ Blaskovich, which just goes to show you how addled Addy is by this point. Now then, you immediately, of course, after leaving Addy's presence, engage in a little of the old ultra-violence. As I stated earlier, the Venus level still doesn't reach the heights of the moon level, and I think that's because you don't get some sort of special Venus-only weapon. The moon level had the laser rifle, and that just made that level that much better. Here, it's still just your standard Wolfenstein level. Yeah, you have to go top up the coolant of your spacesuit, but other than that, it doesn't distinguish itself enough from the other levels in the game. Also, Venus, seriously? Like I said, Mars is of course earmarked for Doom Guy, but it doesn't make a lot of sense for the National Socialists to build a base on Venus. Seriously, what is stopping all of their stuff from being crushed by the massively thick atmosphere of Venus? It's just one of those instances where you have to just repeat yourself, it's just a game. I should probably just relax. And do you want to fight on Venus or not? The game culminates in an epic battle for the Alts Mercer. You don't really face any super amazing bosses, just a few waves of uber soldats. And eventually the game ends appropriately enough in the studio for Johnny Carson, aka Jimmy Carver. Frau Ingle is a guest on the show, and it's up to BJ to ensure that she gets her just desserts. This sequence is pretty well done, and serves as a great capstone for the game. And each time I reached it, I was rather excited to finally put paid to Ingle. And once again, BJ only kills those who try to kill him. When Ingle spots you, she pulls out a Luger and starts shooting. And well, BJ has only one option after all. With Ingle dead, the Chrysal Circle gives a speech that is less than impressive. Thankfully, BJ steps in and reminds people that they need to fight for their kids and ensure that they can live in a world without fear and oppression by the state. And then the game ends. But there is one final touching scene where BJ gives Anya the ring that he found in his childhood home. 
and likely gets even more people to fight against the National Socialists. The game also features some post-game content in the guise of Uber Commander missions. To unlock these, you must first collect Enigma cards off of dead National Socialist officers. You then go to this computer station and solve a simple puzzle, and these little Uber Commander missions are fun enough and keep the game going on after you complete the main story. And so that is Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus. But before this video is called to a close, I must of course have my SJW refutation. In this brave new world of ours, the charge of Nazi and SJW is thrown around all the time. Calling someone a Nazi or a communist or even an SJW is a serious charge and should not be done with impunity. Wolf 2 is in no way shape or form an SJW game. All throughout the game there are elements and moments that do prove this, and none so poignant as this scene. What you got? Fargoys, I decrypted the Odin codes Heb Leskovich brought back from Venus. Turns out it's just one simple word. Valhalla. Type in Valhalla in any of the Odin terminals and you will have permission to shut down the automated defense systems. Well, all right. Now fuck off, Nazi. Like I was saying, we are gonna find that bitch and we are going to take her Please. out. What? Don't ever call me a Nazi again! I am not a Nazi! You do oh. not have the right to label me as something I am not! As someone less than yourself! As someone less than human! Say it! Say I'm not a Nazi! All right. Okay, I get it. You're not a Nazi. If this had been an SJW game, she would have been told to check your privilege and then she would have been shot. This scene should single-handedly prove that this is not an SJW game. She fully expresses the argument that so many have when they are called a Nazi. In this brave new world of ours, anyone who does not fully agree in all ways with the beliefs of SJWs is a Nazi. And as always, they should be punched for not submitting to SJW domination. Ladies and gentlemen, just because someone does not agree with you in all ways does not make them a member of the National Socialist German Workers' Party. And it's high time some piece of media called out those who use Nazi as their shorthand for anyone who doesn't agree with them. And now, let's draw this video to a close. Wolf 2 is a great game all around and is a sequel done right. However, it's not quite as good as the New Order in some ways. The weapons are a bit more boring and it does not have a really cool boss at the end of the game. However, this is made up for by the story and the story itself feels better polished in some ways. But the second half of the game feels a little less focused and a little rushed. On the whole, I would say that New Colossus is of equal quality to the previous game. It is good, but it does not exceed the previous in quality. And I do feel that this game is at the very least better than Doom 2016. Doom 2016 was a great game, but suffered from too many arenas. The glory kill system, while fun for a while, did distract from the shooting. And I hope that Doom 2, 2, is more like Wolfenstein 2 and gives the player larger and more open areas to fight through. All told, Wolf 2 is everything that I wanted from a sequel, and I cannot recommend it enough. I am, of course, General Lotz, and I am wishing you good Wolfenstein 3 Revolution and good Doom 2 2. Come on, if Final Fantasy can have an X2, then surely Doom can have a 2 2. Or whatever makes you happy. If you enjoyed my review of Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus, please consider subscribing for more awesome video game reviews, and if you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon so that I can continue making these video game reviews.